Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Sue Knott, I'm chair of the CMC Advisory Committee and I'm not in my kitchen. <laughs> yes, like the rest of you, I guess. I've been stuck indoors for the best part of the last year, but I'm really excited today because I've come up the road to the home of Wild Sussex and the fuse box here in sunny Brighton. Yes, there are actual guest speakers and a real host sitting within spitting distance. Although I'm not entirely sure whether spitting is allowed under the current social distancing rules, but hey, who knows anymore? Seriously, it's perhaps, perhaps fitting that our first in-person panel since lockdown should be this one. This keynote, all about letting our creativity fly. And soon we'll be hearing from two mighty creatives indeed. Star of stage musicals, primetime drama, studio sitcoms, and of course, one of CBBC's most popular performers over the last two decades, Danny Harmer. And, as well as that, the multi-award winning children's writer who for six months, six, sorry, six years in a row, was the most borrowed author from British libraries, Dame Jacqueline Wilson. And we're delighted to have film and TV critic Rihanna Dillon to guide the conversation. You may have seen her on the uh, co-hosting the BAFTA Film Awards, and we're absolutely delighted to have her here with us again today. We should say a big thank you to the CMC patron sponsors who have backed the whole of the conference and our spring webinars too. And we're extremely grateful to our sponsor for this keynote, Magic Light Pictures. The Magic Light team are currently hard at work on their next stunning animated BBC One special to help all our Christmas dinners go down. Super worm. And they've just launched their first preschool series, Pip and Posy, on Milkshake and Sky. One other huge thanks uh, before we move on to Tony Cook, who has been putting together our keynotes for some years now and is the brains behind this one as well. So thank you to Tony. Coming up at the end of the hour is a belter of a change maker, 13 year old vegan chef and star in the making, Omari, Mc Omari McQueen. You do not want to miss him, I promise. And please don't go away after that because Jacqueline, Danny and Rihanna will be switching platforms and joining the after chat at 5 p.m. So just log into your Chrome browser. And yes, yeah, sorry, Bill Gates, it does have to be Chrome, I'm afraid. Um, then open the wonder to mingle in real time with our panel, just like you're sidling up to them in the Crucible Theatre bar. Well, almost. <laughs> so let's take CMC's first step to being back in the room again and pass over to Rhiannon and Dylan. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Rihanna Dillon and I am absolutely thrilled to be in the company of two people who I have been fans of pretty much my entire life. Joining me to discuss all things Tracy Beaker, an icon for so many people, is the star of Tracy Beaker, Danny Harmer. Hello, welcome. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have the author of Jer Tracy Beaker and so many other much loved classics from you know hundreds hundreds and hundreds of stories that have come out of the brain of Jacqueline Wilson hi hi, hi. lovely to see you again Danny oh, it's, so it's so lovely to see you two reunited as well the, same room. <laughs> the first room you were on Blue Peter together about 20 years ago um, and <laughs> It is, is a real thrill to have you here today. And if any of you are watching and you have questions, which I'm sure you will, then you can use the Q&A button at the top right of your screens and we'll ask some towards the end of the session. So, Jacqueline, let's kick off. Did you think you were going to be 30 years with the character of Tracy Beaker? Absolutely not. <laughs> but she's my lucky character because I had written quite a few books beforehand. But um, as a book collector, I should cherish them because they were all first editions because they never went into any other editions. <laughs> but I did have a, a sort of feeling that when I was writing the, the story, this is quite special. I mm. like this character. But obviously had no idea. And certainly uh, it, it was 
obviously the television series that it was a few years later mm -hmm. that really made Tracy Beaker a household name. But certainly I don't think either of us ever thought that now we would have a show showing Tracy Beaker as a mum. <laughs> and um, who knows? I mean, imagine sort of uh, Tracy Beaker's midlife crisis. Right, <laughs> that, that'll be the next one. <laughs> Tracy Beaker, <laughs> OAP. <laughs> I mean, you never know. <laughs> we're, we're, the, we're a similar age, so I think if you had a midlife crisis, I'd probably in the, be in the midst of one myself. Yeah, we so. can go through it together. <laughs> exactly. That'll be fine. That'll be lovely. <laughs> so what is the secret ingredient to, you know, the success of Tracy? I think it's because she's naughty. <laughs> Children like naughtiness yeah. and she's she's loud and stroppy mm -hmm. and yet I think although maybe some adults passing by the television screen will say, Oh, it's that child again shouting <laughs> all children get Tracy and know that the reason she has to be quite loud is because she hasn't got anybody else to stick up for her. She's had to learn to be tough and stick up for herself. And yet they also, when I used to do heaps and heaps of school visits, and whenever I said to them, why do you think Tracy's so naughty? And they say, because she wants her mum. She's missing her mum. And I think that was the, it was the combination of all the funny bits and the naughty bits, but the sort of underlying poignancy of this kid desperate for her mum, who um, she pops up occasionally, but mostly isn't there. And, you know, I didn't realise that this is a winning formula. So I'm very <laughs> pleased. <laughs> Mums, they're just, you know, so necessary, <laughs> apparently. Danny, you've been with Tracy for 20 years, which is absolutely I know, I, I'm insane. pretty sure I'm not old enough, but <laughs> apparently I am. It's quite terrifying. What was the return like to, <sighs> when you were filming My Mum, Tracy Beaker? It was just bonkers, because it had been such a long time since I'd left, sort of, Tracy. Um, and, yeah, I was kind of like everyone else, really. I was such a big fan, and I kind of wanted to know what was happening next. So as soon as Jacqueline bought out the book, My Mum, Tracy Beaker, I was like... I really hope the BBC call me up and I was just sat by my phone for ages like come on come on you can do it and then I finally got the call to say would I be interested in coming back I was like yes of course um so yeah it's just I mean I just I'm so lucky I I can't think of many people who've been able to play a character for this amount of time unless you're kind of in a soap it just doesn't come around very often so to be able to you know portray Tracy as a child and now she's a mum it's just it's amazing for those of you who might not have seen any of my mum, Tracy Beaker, let's have a look at a little taster. I don't need to eat a lot. Remember when Tracy Beaker was in the dumping ground? And that is how I won the dare game. So I said to Justine Littlewood, you can just bog off! Tracy Beaker is my mum. We're a team. Love you! We've got the best life. But mum has always had big dreams. Tracy Beaker? We used to hang out. You never said you knew Sean Godfrey the footballer. Have fun with Sean Godfrey. He's not mum's type. Well, that changed because somebody believed in me. You really like him? Yeah, I really do. Just wish you did. What about dreaming? It's your house. Come on in. What Imagine if we could stay here always. Then living the dream. What about gravity? But whose dream was it? We just want you to have everything we never had. Are you feeding my prime fillet steak to the dog? You don't get to tell me what to do! No one gets to tell the beef girls what to do. Come on, Jess. Isn't that the thing kind of like Danny Carney used to drive? It was all in my imagination. I just wanted to give you a present. Because I love you. I suppose everyone's a bit starstruck by this famous footballer. Yeah, well, they don't know him. I just want my mum to be happy. Hey! You come first, always. You're my dress. But things are getting worse. What's that? Granny Carly, she's messaging mum again. So I'm because Sean Godfrey's rich and famous. I googled this place, you won't believe what it's worth. What's in his mobile? He's got loads of missed calls. He's hiding something from Mum. And if that wasn't bad enough, Justine Littlewood. My Mum, Tracy Beaker, starts next Friday at 5 on CBBC and BBC iPlayer.
<laughs> it's just gorgeous to see. <laughs> I just love watching you guys. It feels like the Tracy that we know and love has been such a collaboration between the two of you. So how have you worked together to perfect this fan favourite? Well, I think it's, it's been lovely for me because I first saw Dunny when she was 12 and I was taken to, to the set where they were and somebody said, well, get, there were heaps and heaps of kids there, <laughs> loads of extras and mm -hmm. everything. And someone said, well, pick out the one playing Tracy. And I just saw Dunny and I thought, <laughs> they've got it. They absolutely <laughs> got it. And yet it's been so fantastic. Um, seeing all the many series. And then Danny, more or less grown up for um, Tracy Beaker Returns. Um, but then, you know, it's the icing on the cake now to see Danny playing a mum, and she actually is a mum too. Yes. <laughs> and um, it just gives that wonderful feeling of continuity. It's like, it's like my sort of other family. <laughs> so. oh, that's such a lovely thing. Do you kind of have that same feeling about Reimmersing yourself in Tracy's world? Yeah, I think I just, I'm, she's just a part of me now, I think. And it's kind of like putting on a comfy pair of slippers yeah. almost. It just feels natural, and I kind of, I know what to do with the character. I know how she's going to respond to things, and it just kind of it becomes second nature, really, because I've been doing it for such a long time. Yeah. So, yeah, it's great. Does, is there like one emotion that Tracy has that it's really easy to just? snap into oh her temper yeah <laughs> easy easy because it's so far from me right. um but i really enjoy that yeah because i'm I, I never like shout or anything i'm actually quite like a reserved person so yeah when i get to be really angry and i get to like hit things it's great <laughs> and uh, yeah yeah there was a really lovely moment in my mum tracy beaker where your face just kind of you can see the like the red mist descending mm. oh yeah and it just took me straight back to watching it as a kid just that one expression and i yeah. love that that's continued <laughs> oh yeah you can't take that out of tracy <laughs> yeah. she's always going to be a feisty character yeah. that's what i think was such fun too in that every now and then there were just those little tiny flashbacks just to, mm -hmm. to see what what had happened before yeah. and yeah. and it was just so wonderful i mean it, it's such a wonderful source of what has happened yes. and no great <laughs> Um, how do you think Tracy compares to some of your other heroines, like Hetty Feather, for example? I think Tracy is the strongest character. I mean, I'm very fond of Hetty Feather too, who's my Victorian girl, mm -hmm. who's um, sort of edging upwards, saying, now, come on, don't forget me. <laughs> <laughs> Another wonderful CBBC production. But um, I think... What's fantastic is that a whole generation grew up watching mm. Tracy Beaker and it's a kind of, it's a, a, a club that many, many 20-somethings, you know, are, are part of because it's part of their childhood. Yes, 30 something it's brilliant. 30 something I'm afraid. Um, I think that it, Tracy came around just at the right time. Yeah. I think when I was growing up, there was a lot of um, sort of, there was lots of male dominated sort of comedies mm -hmm. and we had wonderful things like the Chuckle Brothers and lots of animations, but there wasn't really that really powerful, strong female mm -hmm. character, um, especially for a kid to sort of relate to. So I think she came at just the most perfect time mm -hmm. uh, for all of us girls to be like, see, yeah, we can be strong too. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's why I think she's been so successful. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think has to change the most between the books and the TV series? You know, what are some of the major shifts? Um, well, inevitably, the, the, first, the first series of My Mum, Tracy Beaker, stuck more or less to the plot outlines of the book. Um, but I'm always perfectly aware that, you know, television is one thing, a book is another. And I was just thrilled to bits when obviously it went off in many different directions, but always with the feel of the books. And I was lucky enough always to have scripts sent to me. And I think there's only been a couple of times in all that time when I've actually said, I'm not quite sure about that little bit. Mm -hmm. Nearly always it was just perfect. But then I've had brilliant, brilliant writers uh, sort of working on 
Tracy. I mean, it was Ellie Brewer who started it off, and she was the chief writer. And, and then we have Mary Morris doing an awful lot. And now, um, my dear friend Emma Reeves has done my mum, Tracy Beaker, and I think she's done a fantastic job, absolutely brilliantly. In fact, it slightly pains me to say, but there are little bits in, in the television version that have been slightly polished up and put slightly differently. And I occasionally think Emma's version is way better than mine. <laughs> so there we go. Not better, just different. Different, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Emma's been on it for quite a while, so it's really nice to get a script and know that that's Tracy's voice straight away. Yeah. You haven't kind of got a writer that's not really sure of the character yeah. or anything like that. She knows exactly what she's doing with it, and it's just in really great hands. And, uh, yeah, I think she's just a genius. I yeah. really do. I mean, you are kind of like, you know, the, the main continuity throughout those 20 years. So are you sort of not fact checking, but are you sort of quite aware of the nuances and what Tracy might and might not do or say? Yeah, I'm very much as soon as I read the script, I read it as Tracy. So I know if something doesn't sit right with me, I know that's because that's not what she would say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not afraid to sort of say, actually, could I maybe try it a bit like this? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm always I know what the fans are like as well. So I'm always <laughs> like, uh, have you thought about how we left it with Tracy Beaker Returns? Because mm -hmm. they're going to be asking questions about this whole timeline mm -hmm. as if we're in the Marvel Super Universe. <laughs> um, and so I was like, I think you need to like really work how how it ties in with the old series because that's what people mm. pick up on um, and they did <laughs> they're like hang on hang on your child's too old but I think it does work out I if I'd left Tracy Beaker returns probably not realizing that I was pregnant yes. then it sort of it all sure. shows in nicely You've thought about it I've really <laughs> thought about this I get asked it a lot <laughs> well speaking of your daughter you know finding the perfect Beaker girl to play your daughter must have been a bit of a challenge mm. but Emma Maggie Davies is amazing oh, as she's yes. phenomenal she's really fantastic i mean what qualities did she have and what was it about her performance that really kind of make that character yeah i mean it was it's, it was always going to be really tricky to cast mini beaker because it's literally what we need we need a mini beaker yeah. so we don't just need someone that's got curly hair and small um, <laughs> she needed to be really really feisty yeah. um and i just needed to be able to see a bit of myself in them mm -hmm. uh, and obviously we had this whole um pandemic going on as well so everything was done online um so the fact that they even found emma was just amazing mm -hmm. and yeah, i couldn't ask for better she is just it was her first ever job Oh, Would you wow. believe, like, looking at her, you'd think that she'd been yeah. working her entire life? Um, yeah, I just can't sing her praises enough. She's got such a bright future ahead of her. And was that the same for you? Well, I think watching Danny and Emma on screen, you really believe, yep, they're mum and daughter. Yes, and, and they have that, that sort of casual intimacy mm. together that um, is really hard to, to do, I think, but just they just are perfect. Yeah, they really are. You really are. Oh, stop <laughs> it, guys. Stop it. Um, I want to take everyone back to the beginning, and I want to see, you know, how Tracy has developed over the years, and talk a bit about that. So let's take a look. Growing up in the dumping ground, like some side case nobody wants. What have you done? I'm never coming out of here. A picnic in the park! Boring. Well, we'll go out to the countryside then. Boring. My back garden? Boring. Tracy. Jackie, I'm dealing with this. Try and be nice, Tracy. Try and not be so useless then! I just keep expecting a bunch of young people to jump out and tell me this is all a wind-up. No wind-up. Just you and me. I've been offered a job in London as a junior reporter for a newspaper. Wow. Look, I've dropped...
dreamt of this job ever since I lived here. I'm sorry, I can't turn it down. It means too much. This is gonna sound so stupid. But there's no other way to say it. I was jealous. It's always been just me and Cam here. Oh, come here. <laughs> sorry. Um, there's a pretty famous catchphrase to come out of Tracy Beaker, <laughs> but for those writers watching, how do you coin a catchphrase? You know, do you do you know the effect it might have when you write it, or is it a lot of it comes through delivery? Oh. Oh, are we talking about bog off? Here? I'm talking <laughs> about bog off. Do, do you know that's not mine? Oh. Um, it was. I don't know whether it was Ellie, um, but somebody else um, chose it. And it's just stayed. Yeah. And then it um, certainly has. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> People literally scream it to me oh, in goodness. the streets. <laughs> uh, but very, very clever mm -hmm. because it sounds rude, it sounds mm -hmm. uh, uh, funny, and yet you would have to be very, very prim if you took exception to it. Yeah. So um, I, know, I think it was very cleverly managed. <laughs> Um, obviously, Danny wasn't in the picture when you first wrote Tracy, but since you've, you know, you've written more books since Danny's embodiment of the character, mm. has she affected the way that you write Tracy? Um, I don't know. I think when I write, I go into my own world, mm -hmm. and I think, in a way, if I was thinking about now, if I'm lucky enough to have a television series, how would they do it and how would Danny do it? I think it might stop the actual flow. Mm. Um, so I tend just to think about my own internal Tracy world and then wonderfully somebody else translates it yeah. and, and Danny acts it and, and that's that and that's absolutely fine. But um, I did, after my mum Tracy Beaker, the book came out. I have to admit, I really hoped it might be taken up. <laughs> and obviously, who else could play Danny's part but Danny? So there we go. Um, we just talked about, you know, you being looked up to and being a role model. Have you felt the weight of being a role model for young audiences? And what impact has that had? Do you know what? I, I haven't felt that, actually, weirdly. Um, probably because, luckily for me, when we sort of did the first series, social media wasn't around, yeah. thank goodness. Because, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I probably would be saying something totally different. Yeah. Um, and you kind of don't realise the, the weight of what you're doing until you actually sort of meet people mm -hmm. on the streets. And that was kind of the only way, really, was to get any feedback, was to actually physically be meeting yeah. the fans um, and having any feedback. So, obviously, it's a very different day and age that we live in now where everyone can just send mm -hmm. you exactly what, what they're thinking. Think, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I probably would have felt a lot more pressure back then had social media been around. Mm -hmm. So thank I, goodness it wasn't. I remember when I met up with Danny's mum, I think we were doing a signing together somewhere. And she said that it first hit home when Danny went bowling mm. and then suddenly everybody in the bowling alley were rushing over and saying it's a girl that plays Tracy Beaker and yeah. it must have taken you by surprise in it a really way. It really did yeah because yeah. uh, again I was sort of 12 years old and I was just out with oh, my family goodness. bowling as you do very normal thing and then suddenly it felt like everyone was just surrounding me and it was just the mm. most bizarre thing and I still find it very strange now to be honest with you mm. like 20 years later so yeah as a teenager I was like oh my goodness what is happening. That's really overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, just a tad. <laughs> there, there is that lovely bit in My Mum, Tracy Beaker, where Cam has a fan in um, Jess's teacher. <laughs> and it really, I think it moved me to tears. It was a really lovely moment. How, you know, I thought that must have been just a bit of you in there for that moment, with people coming up to you and it's, saying how much they love your I mean, character and your work. People always say... Um, you know, I, I'm so sorry, I don't want to, um, you know, stop you doing your shopping or whatever. And I think it's a rare author that doesn't actually <laughs> like to be stopped. <laughs> and some, some child say, oh, I love your books or whatever. It's gorgeous. It, yeah. it really is. And um, apart from the fact Danny and I were talking earlier, it, it's when fans follow you into the ladies' loo. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not a fan of that one, are no. we? <laughs> But, um, no, it, it's lovely because um, 
it, it's lovely to act, it's lovely to write, mm. but you do want to be successful too, and, and that means fans, yeah. so, so it's great. And people don't shout bog off to you, presumably. No, they do sometimes <laughs> get confused <laughs> and say, it's Tracy Beaker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they know, mind you, they sometimes say, oh, it's JK Rowling, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't mind, whatever. <laughs> as long as they're reading. Yes. <laughs> um, there are always discussions about what is or isn't too grown up for children to watch. So how do you approach mature themes for kids in an appropriate way. We see quite a lot in My Mum, yeah. Beaker. It, it is difficult because um, in a book, because I write in the first person, um, I'm in the mind of a child mm. and I can really feel that I only notice what children will notice. If you're watching, it's a different thing entirely. I think particularly that first series, they handled the whole issue of Tracy as a little girl in the past um, very sensitively because I think they did discover that the one thing, far more than scary monsters or whatever, that really upsets children is if the fact that your, your mum goes and or got a scary boyfriend or something like that. And so they didn't overplay that at all, which I think was very, very mm -hmm. sensible. Um, and yet also, I did want to show that life is tough for kids when they go into care. And although um, the, the dumping ground has become, for some children, they think, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? I wish yeah. I could be a <laughs> one. Um, it, and I mean, I loved it that they made it look fun and, and all the rest of it. But they didn't flinch from showing that kids could be unhappy, they could be aching if their parent figure didn't actually arrive at the right time. There's the whole fostering issue. And then also um, the, the whole dilemma of once you've reached a certain age, you're there on your own. I, I think things have changed now, and we do realize that um, as even in your late teens, um, you do need a bit of extra help to, to sort of just steer you and stop you feeling lonely. Mm. Because if you've grown up with a lot of kids around you or in a foster family where there's heaps of kids around you, suddenly to try and make it for yourself, pretty scary, I would think. Absolutely. And uh, we see um, Tracy at her lowest ebb at one point in My Mum, Tracy Beaker. Mm -hmm. How did you film that in a way that was accessible and wouldn't be triggering to young children? I think CBBC do this brilliant thing where they just hit the balance perfectly. So it's not, children don't need to be patronised, mm -hmm. you know, and we were very aware that the audience watching this time around were, was going to be quite fast. We were going to have, you know, the new um, kids sort of younger who probably wouldn't even be familiar with Tracy Beaker mm -hmm. kind of watching it for the first time. But also all of us kind of 30 odd year olds, mm -hmm. you know, um, who have grown up with it. Um, and we wanted it to be relatable as possible. And um, I myself have struggled with uh, mental health problems in the past, uh, along with countless people, you know. So I think we didn't want to shy away from it um, and wanted to play it as as true as possible um, and not do it in a patronising way, um, but still be quite sensitive about it also. So it's not like we went properly in depth with exactly what was going on with Tracy. We kind of just sort of touched on it a bit. Um, mm. And hopefully that kind of causes a bit of a discussion at home maybe, and maybe that makes someone feel a bit more comfortable with being able to talk about their yeah. own mental health with their parents. So uh, yeah, I think CBBC just nail it with mm. things like that. We also have um, a storyline about Justine Littlewood's infertility. And I was thinking about, you know, when you were writing 30 years ago, and perhaps something like that wasn't discussed as much as it is now. And the same, I suppose, with technology, when, you know, we didn't have social media, but we, yeah. we do now. Is that something that you bring in, or do you still kind of like to keep your characters in the world that you initially created? Um, I think you've, you've got to be realistic. Um, I think plot-wise, 
mobile phones have ruined so much for writers because <laughs> whatever dilemma they're in, I mean, they can just phone home to somebody or other. Whereas you, I mean, it, it, it's annoying. And um, I'm not particularly a great fan of, of you know, high-tech stuff. Mm. But um, I, th I think certainly my mum, Tracy Beaker, is in the modern world and you've got to, to go with the flow. So, so I try to do that. Um, I sometimes feel uncomfy as writing Victorian things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hetty can't just pick no, up she can't. mobile. Um, I think something that we were all waiting for was Tracy's reunion with Justine Littlewood. So let's take a look at how that panned out. <laughs> Rosalie. What? I don't think so. No, Alice. That's great. Hi, babe. Justine. Tracy Beaker. And Minnie Beaker. Wow. You look just like your mum. Are you Justine Littlewood? You told her about me. Oh, yeah. I deny everything. So you didn't steal her best friend or make her eat worms? Well, your mum gave as good as she got. I bet she did. Mm -hmm. Why don't you girls relax? I'll go and get another bottle from the cellar. Just a water for me, please. I'll have a cheeky little glass since we're celebrating. Celebrating what? Just a business deal, babe. I market a range of beauty products and Sean said he'll sell them for me in the gym. How do you two know each other? We just met. I saw your photos on Instagram. It wasn't hard to find the place. You've been stalking my mum. It's called networking, using your contacts. I mean, we can't all marry rich footballers. I'm not with Sean for his money. No, but it's a bonus though, isn't it? I mean, beats working in that calf. I don't do that anymore. Oh, don't blame you. I couldn't do it myself. Oh, that lack of mental stimulation. But then again, I did get a first class degree, so. Mum's written a book. And she's sending me to a centre of creative excellence so I can have every advantage. Lucky you. Must be nice having everything going for you. It's a bit different for us, wasn't it, Tracy? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was <laughs> a highlight, I've got to say. <laughs> so how was the reunion with Justine, a.k.a. Montana Thompson? It was <laughs> fabulous. It was as if, like, no time had passed. It was so funny. Um, <clears throat> like, seeing her, as soon as we started doing our scenes, it was literally like going back in a oh, really? time machine. It was like being 15 again. Uh, and we just sort of went straight into the kind of... Um, back and forth that we normally do uh, and yeah it was it was great to see Montana uh, we're both parents now so lots oh, changed wow. so we've you know had a lot to talk about um, and I just couldn't believe that Montana literally looks exactly, exactly the same exactly. as before I was like did we freeze you <laughs> like how is this a thing that's so unfair that you look exactly the same um, so yeah it was it was such good fun especially like the fight scene and stuff that we had to do it was just brilliant it's, we've really got the giggles as I well loved it. I loved watching that yeah. <laughs> um, just a reminder, if you've got any questions for Jacqueline or Danny, please put them in the Q&A chat at the top right of your screen. Um, Tracy is such a great mum. How important was it that she doesn't have a difficult relationship with her daughter? I wanted very much to show <clears throat> that if you've had difficult parenting and a parent that lets you down, you've been in the care system, this does not mean that you will go on and become uh, an indifferent parent yourself. I thought particularly with Tracy, she realised how important having a mother who is there for you all the time and who gives you sort of love that is always there um, would be for her. And so I mean, I think Tracy still has a few anger issues just, as an adult, bit, but <laughs> never loses her temper with Jess. Just is there a protective mum mm. and just the sort of ideal mum that she really needed. And so I, I did think that was very important. And I have, over the years, I've met many young people who have been in the care system and um, I, I, the ones that I, I know really quite well have grown up to be superb parents. So I'm flying the flag for particularly the success of fostering to show yeah. children, you know, what just being in an ordinary loving family is like. Mm. So all power to that. <laughs>
How, how did you kind of work to reflect care experience characters in the later sequels? Um, I tried to keep up with things as much as possible. The trouble is that um, the care system has changed quite a lot. And I would imagine that there are really very few children's homes similar to, to the one that is used. But um, true to the whole spirit of the way things are, and um, also because, because I have got involved with the whole Tracy thing, I often get invited to sort of um, special award ceremonies mm -hmm. for, for different people in care. And I'm very proud to be an ambassador for the East Sussex Foster Care Association and um, go to the Fostering Network Awards every year. And so I, I sort of still keep up as, as much as I possibly can. And uh, I haven't gone quite as far as fostering my own Tracy. <laughs> it's a bit late in the day for that. <laughs> um, Danny, I think you tweeted, I will do everything in my power that Tracy will not come out of this series as another negative stereotype. So mm -hmm. how did you work on the show to ensure that? Um, I think with Emma, we had quite a lot of frank conversation because obviously with it being Twitter, people can just message me their opinions yes. all the time. <laughs> and um, lots of carer experience people reached out to me and was kind of like, you know, my experience wasn't quite like Tracy's. Um, and obviously there is a lot of pressure on Tracy Beaker because there's not a lot of carer experience stories. So kind of the pressure is all on this kind of one character. And obviously this is Tracy's journey. This is only Tracy's mm. story it's not everyone's so to try and be able to represent a whole community with just that one character is almost impossible so I know that Emma did quite a lot of zoom meetings with various care experienced people just to sort of you know get a kind of wider image of what it's like mm. as an adult um, a care experienced adult um, and I hope that we kind of portrayed that a bit more but obviously it is Tracy's unique story mm. so it's not going to be everyone's yes mm -hmm. um so that's why we need even more stories the more <laughs> care experience stories would be great yeah absolutely and Jacqueline some authors can be a little bit wary of screen adaptations of their books so what is your general approach not necessarily just to Tracy but you know if you're being approached for a, a new series or with Hetty or whatever what is your approach to that? I've I've always been very lucky but I think it so helps if you know the people that want to do the adaptation and know the specific team. And um, I have been, you know, treated so royally by CBBC. <laughs> and that, that's absolutely great. Um, and I've always been open to the, the way um, people want to adapt my books. Um, and, but it always helps to, to have some idea if they, they have a sort of proposal. So I can see if, if there was a really quite sad and, and touching story and they wanted to make it a really laugh a minute comedy, I would say, no, that's probably not the right approach. Yeah. But um, if, if it seems a really um, carefully thought out adaptation, not necessarily sticking entirely to the way I've written a book, but um, something that I think will really work, um, and then I, I generally want to know who the writer will be, first of all. And um, I've, I've just been royally spoilt, spoilt mm. I really have. So it's been fine. And um, I, I've always been very well behaved if ever I've been on set of any <laughs> adaptation. <laughs> I, I sit very quietly in the corner uh, because, you know, I know some authors think they can just stride in on, on some wonderful teamwork thing and just say, no, you should do it that way or whatever. So, no, it's fine. The, the, the one thing I wish I could get invited to is a casting session. And so many
many children write to me if they hear that something's going to be adapted mm -hmm. and send me photos and say, look, I, I know this character, I could play it. And I think if only I had that influence, but I don't. I have promised, I promised to sit behind a curtain just so I could hear the children <laughs> auditioning. It would be so interesting, yeah. but not, not so far. Oh, really? <laughs> nope. Interesting. Next time, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> How would that have been for you, Danny, like having... I would have passed out. Well, <laughs> if Jacqueline Wilson had been in the room, I'd have been like, I wouldn't have got the part. There's no way. <laughs> Absolutely not. I would have just collapsed in a heap. So, uh, yeah, it's probably a good thing that you weren't uh, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you draw the line between lots of callbacks to Tracy's past and then starting fresh ideas and introducing new characters? It's really it's what sort of thing I want to focus on. So with my mum Tracy Beaker and then there's a sequel to that, We Are the Beaker Girls, mm -hmm. I did think it would be interesting whether actually Tracy herself could make a good foster mum. And, um, and then I thought the dynamic between Tracy and Jess might be slightly changed if that did happen. So that was where I was going in the second book. And also I thought we have a complete change of setting too. And, and yet still keep up with some of the characters yeah. in, in the earlier books. So it's... Um, haven't quite decided where I might be going next, but uh, it, it's still, it, you know, it would be very odd seeing my brain because the sort of whirling thoughts are around the whole Tracy scene and, and then the, the, the other books too. And, uh, but I, f I feel so lucky because I don't just have to think, oh gosh, I've got to queue up in the supermarket now. I can think <laughs> all these interesting <laughs> thoughts instead. <laughs> such a lovely way of looking at it. <laughs> probably think, oh, there's that weird woman muttering to herself. <laughs> <laughs> but if, you have, if you're in a supermarket, where are you jotting things down? Oh, well, I, try, I have a theory that if an idea actually lasts until I get home, it's maybe a reasonable one. Yeah. And certainly if that little jotting, if I look at it the next day and it still seems to be a good idea, mm -hmm. then that's okay. Often I look and think, good Lord, how did I ever think that that would work? So, so, it's a, so I don't actually stand there scribbling. Yeah. <laughs> What have the audience reactions been to my mum, Tracy Beaker? As you say, so many of us have grown up with you, so that you, you're kind of like a direct line. Yeah, it's just been bonkers, actually. I was kind of thinking, oh, it's going to go either way. People are going to be, like, super excited that it's come back, or they're going to be like, oh, not her again, we're bored of her, we don't care. And it just, like, blew up. It was beyond anything that we could ever imagine, really. I mean, I kind of knew that people would be interested mm -hmm. and kind of would want to watch it, but, I mean, I, we, like, broke the iPlayer, which is just crazy. <laughs> um, That's so, cool. yeah, it was just beyond my wildest dreams. And, yeah, we just had such great feedback. And, um, yeah, I think the, the best thing to come out of it was Cam finally getting her happy ever after <laughs> that she so deserved. <laughs> Um, and I, yeah, everyone kind of, all us kind of 30 odd year olds are like, yes, finally, <laughs> yes, she's being her true self. And it was just the most wonderful thing to shoot as well, because I literally felt like that 12 year old that knew that Cam uh, wanted to get married one day and was just going to live happily ever after. And then she did. And it was just great. Uh, it was <laughs> honestly like the best feeling in the world. Mm -hmm. And I was so relieved that it wasn't you getting married with yes, to, to right. Sean. It I was... know when I read the script, I was like, oh no, oh no, oh, I okay, know, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Emily's was so clever because yes. it just went so smoothly and you thought, oh gosh, where are we going here? Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. suddenly, wow. <laughs> yeah. And it really was a wow in yeah. the yeah. loveliest of senses. Just going back to what you were saying about um, having, having the direct line audiences being able to talk directly to you, how much does that influence then what you end up, you know, how much are they kind of a voice in the back of your head when either you're writing or performing? Yeah, I tend to sort of not think about that, actually. Mm. Otherwise, I think I would go a bit mad and kind of just go with my own instincts. Like, I, I know the character now. I, I know how she would react and how she would respond to things. So I tend to go with that rather than mm. what everyone else has been telling me. Otherwise, yeah, I think mm. you'd go a bit mad. Yeah, I, I think, too, that... I mean, I've... 
I've very much benefited from talking to various groups of care leavers and listening to their ideas. And I have taken some on board. But as Danny was saying earlier, it's not about showing what life is like for everybody in care. It's one person's experience. Mm. Well, not one person, because there's, you know, Justine and mm -hmm. yeah. Peter and, and the others. But I w also wanted to show a variety of things. And also, I didn't want every single person to become an enormous high achiever and very rich and all the rest of it. Because I, I think the biggest achievement is becoming a strong, loving person yeah. with great relationships. And, you know, the, the, there's a sort of up and down thing. I mean, it rather tickled me to make Peter a headmaster. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could imagine him being that. Yes. But, um, and I think... Uh, you know, for, for Tracy, uh, she's got so much bounce and enthusiasm. I'm, I'm sure at some stage, you know, she, she will become a successful professional woman. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But as you say, I think the most important thing is that Tracy is a brilliant mum. Yes. And that in itself is a huge yes. achievement. So. And I mean, when you... I, I sort of feasted on a whole glut of, of, of DVDs of Tracy Beaker right from the beginning and seeing the movie of me and then re-watching my mum, Tracy Beaker. And it's extraordinary how different things match up. And that pink Cadillac oh. um, in the, the, my movie of me, there it is and there it is in my mum, Tracy Beaker. And um, there are all sorts of little ties and things that um, it, it's very satisfying to see how it does all gel together. Yeah. Um, that Cadillac. Yes, that Cadillac. <laughs> Can I just say that I have the shortest legs ever, so it could not reach the pedals, so it was really fun to drive. I had to have about eight cushions behind oh me, and I was God. like this close to the steering wheel just so I could reach. Well, you look um, like a natural. Yeah, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I tried to make it look really cool, but it was a hard thing to drive. It was a, a big piece of metal, a really big piece of metal, wow. and um, we were always freezing because oh. we were in Manchester, and it was always raining with the, the roof down. The glamour. So, yeah, so glamorous. <laughs> Still loved it, though. Did, did did they have to take out special insurance or something for you to drive it? Probably, I imagine so, because honestly, I'm far too short for that car. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be getting one myself. It did um, look good, though, and, yeah, and the, the music was, was the Barbie theme tune. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I thought, just that worked perfectly. It really did. Yeah. It was so funny. We've just got um, one question in from Gary, who wants to ask, has Jacqueline ever written content in her children's books that she's felt later is too mature for her audience? And if so, how do you go about self-editing such content? Um, it's not so much me, it's my editors <laughs> thinking, hmm, Jacqueline. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I don't think so. We have to soften <laughs> this bit. And there's a lot of negotiation. I think most things you can tackle. I, I don't think I would do real violence, say. I think that's just too very much upsetting. Um, and there are things you can do from a child's point of view that you can imply, not necessarily show. Um, it always puzzles me that people think that children's television <clears throat> should reflect some wonderful, happy world where nothing bad ever happens. And yet most kids are still around when the soaps are on. They're not sent off to bed. Mm -hmm. And you see all sorts of you know, bizarre and yeah. melodramatic situations. <laughs> so no, I, I, I feel that um, I've been given a lot of freedom. Mm. And, but I do take things very seriously. And um, I'm certainly not in the business of upsetting children, worrying children. I want to reassure children. And um, I, th I think it is difficult, though. And I will always listen if somebody says to me, no, we don't think you should do this because even if just one child was really upset by it or um, encouraged to do something really stupid or whatever, then, then I will be very careful indeed. 
I'm so sorry, we're going to have to leave it there. I've got so many other things to ask you. Maybe this is for later on, though, you know, our little backstage thing. Um, thank you so much to our wonderful guests, Danny Harmer and Jacqueline Wilson. So they will both be around until 5.30 mm -hmm. to answer any other questions that you might have, basically, as um, Sue was saying, basically a virtual chat at the bar, which is great. Um, now, 13-year-old Omari is an award-winning vegan chef Instagrammer, YouTuber, author, entrepreneur, campaigner, and TV <laughs> presenter. Oh my goodness. He has always had a passion for cooking, but at the age of seven, Amari began to truly hone his skills by focusing on healthy family meals. And a year later, he founded his first food business, Dipalicious, great name, and launched YouTube tutorials inspiring other young people how to cook. In 2020, Amari and his family starred in a CBBC cooking show, What's Cooking, Amari, which saw him combine his love of great food with fun and family time. Everything Amari does is under the mantra of good food can do good. Here he is. Hi everyone, my name is Amari McQueen. I'm 13 years old and I'm the youngest multi-award winning vegan chef in the UK and the youngest restaurant and celebrity TV chef in the world. I've been running my own company named Dipalicious since I was eight years old. Dipalicious sells really healthy dips that I've made. Cocoa curry is my best seller, but my favorite is the loving jerk as it's spicy and I can handle the heat. Spice is life. I also run YouTube tutorials and teach workshops to help other children make my recipes at home for their family. And every Tuesday my Instagram delivers top tips on healthy fruits and vegetables. And last year I filmed my first show on CBBC called What's Cooking Amari. The best part about it is that my whole family was involved and my recipes were 100% vegan. Thank you, CBBC. And in January, I published my first ever cookbook called The Mari's Best Bites Cookbook, which was amazing. When I was eight years old, I was researching about what could get my mum better and back on her feet again as she was sick. And then I found this horrible video about how animals were treated for food and clothes and I didn't like the way that was happening. So I decided to become vegan and bring people together through food without harming animals, as I love the animals. The small and big decisions we make every day are really important. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. The decisions you make when you're making your show. And here are the top five things I would like you guys to think differently about. One, two, three, four, five. Five. Number one, please stop making shows about zoos or about people visiting zoos because animals are not supposed to be kept in cages. How would you feel if you were kept in one place and people were staring at you all the time? Seriously guys, it's not right. Number two, animals need a nice place to live, so we all need to be kinder to the planet so it's nicer for them. So please guys, when you're making your shows, show people recycling, not using disposable plastic or anything like that. Also guys, think really, really, really carefully about how much of the planet's resources you're using when making your show. Number three, animals are not clothes. Sheep are not slippers, cows are not leather bags. There are so many kind of alternatives out there to things like Ugg boots and leather bags. And when you're deciding on costumes for actors and presenters, please use different materials like fake leather jackets, please. And vegan shoes. Number four. No, oh, that's free. Number four, this one is really important, don't harm animals. There are many great other foods out there, like jackfruit instead of meat and oat milk instead of cow's milk. I put cashew nuts in the blender and it's really creamy, perfect for my dad's favourite, cosy macaroni. When you're making your shows, could you have people eating healthy vegan food on screen and when you're getting lunch for your cast and crew, why not make it vegan? Some people might think that vegan food is boring. It's not. You can have amazing desserts just like my mum's favourite, my yum plum crumble. Mm. 
told you it was nice. Delicious curries, yummy snack bars, and my barbecue jackfruit wraps. Vegan food is delicious. It's just delicious. It's delicious. Yummy, it tastes so dope. Sometimes if you don't tell them it's vegan, they won't notice and it will still be good and fill you up. Did I say good? I mean great. And my final top tip is important too. Make sure you do your research on the things that you are eating. Please encourage your young viewers to find out as much as they can about where their food and clothes come from so they can make their own choices. Those were my five top tips. I'm Omari McQueen and thank you for listening to me today. And if you need any ideas for recipes, you can always buy my book, Amari's Best Bites Cookbook. I hope you have a great time at the Children's Media Conference. Bye! Thank you so much to Amari. <laughs> what an incredibly talented teenager. CMC will be back tomorrow morning at 11 with the CMC debate on the future of public service media for young people. And remember, if you want to get involved in speed meetings with tomorrow's commissioners, then you need to book into those early. Booking opens at 9am UK time. If you're feeling sociable, tonight is quiz night at CMC. It's been moved earlier to avoid the football. Don't worry, priorities. <laughs> so it's going to be from 6.30 to 7.30, hosted by Quizmaster Steve Wynn. And it's brilliant. It's a laugh. It's got huge prizes, dreadful prizes. Um, it's on Zoom. And the link is in a red box in the session description for this session. So is the link as well to take you to the Wonder Chat for kind of to wonder for our little chat in a minute and remember to use a chrome browser and do hurry because we are not stopping we've got to get ready for this quiz thank you so much once again to danny and jacqueline for joining me today oh, thank, thank you, you. Thank wonderful you. thank you and goodbye